All right, good day, hi, and welcome. Okay, we're gonna have a just a. It's gonna be a talking video. It's gonna be a discussion video about uh, tone woods, and I probably covered it before, but I, I thought I'd cover it again because I think uh, a lot of people don't understand the benefit of understanding the concept of tone woods and what they do and all that. So I got pictures here. Uh, about you know some of them from my old bands from the 90s and stuff like that <laughs> and uh, some of the guitars that you might see some violins in here it's just out of the folder I got but I try to keep it all relative to guitars that I've played and stuff like that I wish I had more live show stuff pictures uh, but anyway uh, but one thing uh, you got kind of two camps of people people that are uh, religiously fanatic about how tone woods are the only you know like that's how you pick a guitar and other people are tone woods are just a farce they're just something as a gimmick to sell more guitars and the way I look at it is if you can't hear the difference then you know there's really you know like don't worry about it right but for those that can hear the difference uh, this will probably make life a little bit easier for you because there's a couple of things to consider and I, you'll see the debate of tone woods go something like this I am going to build a kind of like a a log guitar put one string on it one or two strings on it like an, an E and a high E and a low E I'll use the same pickup I'll make the use the same exact same guitar neck and I will strap it to a piece of maple, I'll strap it to a piece of mahogany, a piece of uh, alder, a, a poplar, or basswood, um, coral wood, swamp ash, what, whatever, you know, mahogany, what, whatever, if I didn't already say mahogany, uh, whatever wood, you know, you can find out there, right? And they'll give you like a dry tone and just, you know, banging away on a string, don't, don't, like that. And sometimes you can hear it. And, and I usually can hear the differences. Uh, but it doesn't really give you what tone wood is about. Like, that's not how it works. Uh, other thing is people using, like, basically frequency data. You know, it resonates at this hertz and that hertz and whatever. It, it tells you what's going on, but it doesn't really tell you. It doesn't really give you the full picture of what, what you're hearing, right? and so it's kind of one of those weird things where you won't understand tone woods there's only two volumes you can understand tone woods at and the first one is at what i call stage volume or concert volume pick your verbiage doesn't matter you're on stage people at the back of the room have to hear you regardless of the size of the room right so if it's a stadium people got to hear you at the back if it's a uh, small bar with 10 people in it they got to hear it hear you at the back it has to cut through the mix the other is strangely enough is the guitar completely unplugged and you're going to learn a lot about a guitar completely unplugged it can just tell you whether it's even worth plugging it in or not uh, now tone woods can vary in quality they can vary in a whole bunch of things sometimes it's not just about you know having like not all mahogany guitars are created equal this is my a G400 Epiphone not a bad guitar not gonna lie to you it's a good guitar uh, but it does not sound as good as my other Gibson SG's made out of mahogany but there's a lot more that goes into those guitars such as good fret work uh, it's you know aged wood uh, you know whatever M most of the wood is going to be aged to a degree that where at least it's dry uh, but you know there's there's A grades there's B grades you know wood is a, is a a whole kind of pseudoscience in a lot of ways uh, but there's just sometimes one block of wood will just sound better than another block of wood why is this I have no idea it just is what it is this is why when you walk into a music store try every guitar on the wall that you can uh, even the ones uh, what gets most guitar players is they walk into a store and they see the cool guitar and they go pick it up and say that's the guitar I want that's my dream guitar uh, and then they find out later on that it's really not so they spend like 500 bucks or whatever on a guitar price is arbitrary and they just find out that they bought something that they didn't really want that they got fell in love more with the image than they did the actual guitar you know what I mean like so, some guitars sell themselves just because they look cool and somebody with a cool guitar will always say oh this thing's awesome this is great is it 
it could be awesome. It could be great. Because you can get, like, for example, uh, Jackson is known for this. I have, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship for Jackson guitars. I love the looks of, mo like, the, the, the uh, Rhodes Vs. I have one. Um, uh, but yet, you know, some of their guitars, at some of the price points they have, they're still using basswood body on, like, guitars over a thousand bucks. I'm like, there's no need for that at that price point. You, you could start getting better materials on there. Uh, so let's let's stick with the core woods. Okay, so when you go into a music store and you have a wood that's more dense, it tendly, it's ten going to be, particularly like mahogany, for example, uh, the, the thing you're going to find is that those dense woods tend to really be you, they usually tend to be a darker sound, like mahogany, but mahogany has a really upper mid-range, which makes it great for guitar solos. It gives you that really crunchy, classic out front sound. And it, you know, a mahogany guitar some, a lot of times will pop through if it has a rosewood fingerboard. Now, infinite co combinations of woods. Uh, for example, a mahogany body with a maple fingerboard and neck is not going to sound as, quite the same as a mahogany body with a maple neck and a rosewood or an ebony fingerboard they're going to change a little bit uh if you have a full mahogany body like a lot of gibsons are and my sgs are where the neck is also mahogany the, and, and a rosewood fingerboard you have a guitar that's sitting it's got lots of low end but it's going to be sitting right smack dead center with a high mid right in the mid range uh but you've got a guitar that really res resonates now bolt on versus neck through body you got to take all that into consideration too but what I usually do is take two guitars. Let's say we'll use my Jackson Flying V here. Now, this is what I bought as a jam neck guitar. So it's a basswood body, maple neck, and uh, fingerboard. And I'll tell you that guitar, okay, it doesn't sound bad, but the body is, you know, like basswood basically has the tonal qualities of a rotten tree stump, you know. And I can contest to this because I've heard them at high enough volume and enough of them at high enough volume that they get either really muddly, really muddy, really bassy uh you know and they just like there's almost like no highs in it uh but however the the brilliance of the maple is that there's almost no bad maple out there like a maple will always give you a very consistent bright sound uh, whether it's in the body or on the fingerboard or on the neck it will always kind of give you that that's why i like maple you know and yeah rock maple versus soft maple okay yeah you'll get a bit of a variation but i mean there's a reason why stratocasters are you know have the sound they have most of them are formulated with uh you know like the with a, with a maple body neck and fingerboard and that's what gives you that really great highs and mids and a really chunky bottom end uh makes it great for clean playing right um, lead, it can be a bit twangy, it could be a bit over bright, it, whatever. So you want a bright sound, you're talking maple, you know. But what if you want to smooth out that sound more for a metal sound? Well, maple fingerboard, maple neck, and an alder body, that is about as, like, that's like putting your EQ right in the middle with uh, a tendency at the higher bright end of, of, of the range. Uh, it, it's a very, very smooth sounded wood and probably one of the best woods I've heard at high volume because sometimes less is more. Where if you have a guitar like, say, like a mahogany guitar, you've already got a dark sounding guitar. You've already got a lot, you know, like a lot of sustain, a lot of bassiness, right? And what happens is when you start cranking that up, it, you know, you get a bit of a feedback loop on stage uh from the monitors and the vibrations through the floor the you know your pickups pick up your pickups picking up picking up <laughs> you know you know what I mean? if that makes sense uh it's a weird thing like if you've ever been on stage and you got a drummer and he crashes a cymbal while you have the guitar kind of face towards him in the air and you're not playing you're going to hear the cymbals coming out through the uh through your guitar amp right uh, it will pick it up. It will pick up, picking up, picking up, pick up, picking up. <laughs> you know I mean, hence why you can get like a lot of unwanted no noises at high volumes. But you won't truly know the character of your guitar until it's overdriven at a high volume. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So, if we're going to pick a guitar for a specific type of sound, okay? Maybe you want a metal guitar, but maybe you don't want something that just sounds like you're in Slipknot, right? Maybe you want to sound more like Van Halen. Uh, 
maybe you don't want to sound like Van Halen, Halen you want to sound more like uh, you know Metallica you know what I mean and if you look at the guitars that these guys play like I mean uh, James Hetfield still plays like Les Pauls and, and Gibson Explorers predominantly but I've seen Kirk Hammett out there with the uh, freaking Stratocasters uh, Skid Row, they got uh, the Slave to the Grind album, really, really heavy. I just listened to it reason, uh, recently. I didn't realize how much Scotty Hill plays Stratocasters on that, and he, you wouldn't think a Stratocaster could get that sound. But there's a lot of things that come into play for the sounds. Number one, he's using a, a humbucker and two single coils rather than three single coils, right? He would never achieve that that driving guitar sound. And I've heard Skid Row live years ago. They were great, and uh, also Pantera Life, and they were great too. Um, one of the best sounding bands I ever heard live, and what was really cool is because one of the guitar players played, pretty much played a different guitar on every song, and that was Pearl Jam. I saw them live twice. They were the clearest sounding band, and we're talking, you know, big arena, you know, like, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 people, whatever was in, was in there. Um, and an enclosed arena and they just had such great tone now one cool thing about those guys is they still kind of pretty much play without effects and through the app they use a little bit of effects once in a while but they're really going with that natural tone natural amps i mean at one point i mean there was telecasters on the stage there was uh, es 335s there was uh, strats there was uh, uh sgs there was les pauls everything you would imagine right uh, the other one guitar player pretty much played a strat the entire night. The other guy, he was like, you know, every song he was grabbing a different guitar. <coughs> they even had some hollow body gretches and everything. And each guitar at that volume was clear, crystal clear because of the PA and all that that, that they used. At one point, I think Eddie Vedder was out there with a Telecaster with a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe with a mic in front of it. Uh, and it just everything sounded stellar. All the volume was being pushed from the modders, not so much from the amps, but the amps were at their op set for their optimal tone. We'll get into that too. Um, so you really heard the character of these guitars and you could say, okay, well, I know if I want a really crunchy sounding bright guitar, uh, as long as you could deal with the feedback of it, uh, what beats a Gretsch going through the amp? You know, like what a great sounding guitar. Uh, but you also notice that at high volumes, that Gretsch is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna get you the crunch sound, but it's not gonna clean up. You know what I mean? It's not going to clean up. The SGs are like that at high volume. They don't clean up. So they're really, they're not, I'm not saying that you can't play clean with them, but if you're playing through a tube damp, <laughs> after a certain volume, you just got to lead three lead channels. You know what I mean? Uh, like there's just no, like no way to, you, you can't even roll the volume off without it barking at you. Like it's, it's, it's a really overdriven guitar. Les Pauls can be the same. Strats, a lot of them, if you have the right pickup combinations there, you can really clean those things up at volume. It's amazing how clean a Strat can stay. At high volumes uh, not all of them like i mean like the 50 strats they tend to stay really really clean the telecasters same thing they tend to stay really really clean uh they you know the course quality of the guitar comes into play uh pickups come into play all that but the tone woods also come into play you know what i mean so one of my best sounding guitars i don't have it anymore and i sold it i, I do regret getting rid of it but on the other hand, it was like, you know, the neck was warped on it from all the gigs I did. And that was my uh, 94 Hammer Diablo, which replaced uh, that white Ibanez RG750 that you saw earlier on in the video, because uh, that one got stolen. Now, my RG750, it was a $1,200 guitar back in the day, and that thing was had a basswood body. Now, the nice thing about a basswood body is the things are light, nice and light. Uh, Alder gives you a little bit more though. Alder actually gives you really good tone without the weight. So it, it gives you the benefit of a lightweight guitar like uh, Basswood, but it, you know, Basswood, like I say, has the tonal qualities of a rotten tree stump. That's why almost all the low end guitars are made with Basswood. They just, it's really, it's a softer wood, which the strange thing about uh, Poplar is like, it's a soft wood, but when it dries, you can barely drive a nail through it. It just tightens up so hard, which makes it, you know, you know, a decent, a decent wood for reliability. But it also doesn't seem to breathe at all and give you any tonal qualities. It gives you a really chunky, muddy, low end without all the, the nice highs and brilliance. Again, doesn't mean that every guitar that's made out of basswood isn't going to sound good. 
uh, and got my chainsaw in here. <laughs> I don't know how that one ended up in that folder, but uh, well, anyway. Um, the the point I'm making is is that uh, it's when you compare apples to apples is when you really understand. Like you grab a Jackson Flying B for we'll just use this for an arbitrary example. Uh, same neck setup, maybe rosewood fingerboard, maple neck, very common, right? And one has a swamp ash body, one has a, uh, an alder body, and one has a mahogany body, and one has a maple body, and one has a, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, a, a basswood body. You're going to notice the tone differences. You're not going to notice it at practice amp volume, though. That, that, that's the thing. Like, at practice amp volume, even the cheap guitars sound good. It's when you push these guitars at the higher volumes. That's when you hear everything magnifies. So your output pickups, for example, what I discovered myself, and this is why, and this is what will happen to you, is you'll get two guitars. You'll have one reasonably good guitar or a really good guitar, and then one that's kind of like, okay, that was maybe your starter guitar or whatever as the backup. Well, that backup guitar never gets played. Why? It doesn't have the sound. It doesn't have the whatever. I'll use two guitars that I had as an example. I used to play through my Mesa Boogie half cab and a Randall RT100 head, 100 watt head. And then on top of that, I had this thing called the GFX, uh, DOD GFX7 twin tubes. And it was a great uh, rack effects and stuff like that. This thing sounded awesome in the room, but it was a real pain in the ass. You know, er, uh, you, know uh, you couldn't use the EQ on it at all live because every room would just change the sound so drastically. You'd lose all your mids or you'd have too many mids or whatever, and you, you were constantly programming this thing. But when you got it dialed in, wow, what a sound. Now, if I was playing my Hammer Diablo, which had really good Samer Duncan pickups in it and whatever, here's what would happen if I broke a string. Well, I'd put that guitar aside with the Alder body, Rosewood fingerboard, maple neck. This guitar... And I had many sound men tell uh, many people tell me this. That was one of the best live sounding guitars they'd ever heard, and myself included. And I wasn't just being biased, but it was like I had a really good live sound. And then I pick up my Epiphone Les Paul, which still sounded good, but there were uh, the output difference wasn't that much. But it sounded like there was a big volume drop, and there wasn't really a big volume drop so much from one guitar to the other. Uh, there was a bit because the uh, you know the the guitar, the, the Epiphone unplugged when you played them, even though the, the hammer had a, a, a Floyd Rose in there, the guitar was just whatever wood they used, which was Alder in the body, but whatever grade they used, it resonated better, meaning the guitar unplugged was actually louder. It produced more volume, and it also produced more tone, but not only that, it was m the tone of the guitar was incredibly clear so you had good lows but not so much lows that it got muddy when you cranked it up right so in other words you you had the kind of the less is more effect the mids were almost flat right across the board where they were nice mids but they didn't really cut through like say like i said like on the mahogany guitars or the maple guitars but it was a nice smooth blend from the low to the mid and then the highs were the same where they weren't the highest of highs like you would get on maple but it was very nice blend overall so when you brought up the volume and you had really clear pickups in it what you did is you amplified a really nice clear guitar which when you threw some effects on that you had a, you know basically a crunchy raunchy tone but it was also a sweet tone on the you know like it was a very smooth tone across the board which at high high volumes and again the loudest PA system that I know I played through was 13,000 watts and it wasn't the biggest bar ever but it was it was pretty good and then I uh, if you're was wherever in Ottawa you know, where we played the big bars to play uh, two of them aren't there anymore was Roxanne's Bar and Grill and it would be like equivalent to the Roxy in Los Angeles in fact the bar was probably a tad bit bigger than that when I've been been in both and the sound man there he was uh, he was awesome. He was awesome. Uh, and then the other place I played was called Grand Central. We opened up for April Wine there. That was really cool. Uh, and it was probably the biggest bar in auto. It was just a lot. Of, it, I think it was like it, the building ended up getting condemned years ago. 
and uh, you know they shut it down, they bulldozed it. Now I think they put a high rise there or something, whatever they did. But it had a big stage there, and they had a good sound system in there. And then there was uh, Barrymore's, uh, which is still standing. It's an old theater, like a thing's probably 150 years old, whatever it is. It's this old theater, and they used to have a huge stage in there, and then they condensed it down into dance floors and stuff like that. But I played in there a couple of times, and can't tell you the crowd sizes but a couple of hundred people anyway you know when they were at full capacity a few hundred maybe you get like 300 people in, in Barrymore's three to five hundred people in Barrymore's and Grand Central was maybe about two to three hundred that you could get in there Roxanne's maybe one or two hundred you know if you depending on how you pack people in a back in the day the bars weren't too stringent about you know capacity limits so if you could get squeezed in there <laughs> you got in there but the point is is I played at volumes that were you know like I played on the same stage Ingve Malmsteen played on not at the same time unfortunately but uh, I played on like big like a big stage like that and again monitors all around professional sound and a good sound man and that taught me about my good guitars and my not so good guitars. But it wasn't even just my guitars, it was hearing other people's guitars. You'd have this guy, fantastic player with a really cheap $300 Samic guitar. And it's like the guy's playing would be good, great, but it's like you, it was unaudible because the guitar was so muddy and you know, you just couldn't get the drive at it and the clarity, right? Where, um, you know, a lot of it had to do with the tone woods. I mean, uh, that uh, Explorer guitar you saw in here, that TCM Explorer, that thing had a plywood body. That thing was mud central, but it was a cool guitar. You know, like it was my second guitar, but it was a cool guitar. Uh, but when you got it up to volume, that's when you realized how, what it didn't have, right? So when we were talking about tone woods, you know, like the tone woods, like I say, you don't really, you can't really measure it until you've played. A bunch of gigs and I've probably all in probably 270 gigs plus jam nights uh, over the years right um, obviously people aren't playing as much anymore with what's going on in the world at the making of this video hopefully that changes fairly soon uh, but you know when you get a good tone wood right what happens is you tend to play that guitar a lot because it sounds better even if you can't really distinguish why this guitar sounds better than maybe that guitar or whatever, but what happens is you're going to start to understand, once you start to understand tone woods, you're going to understand the musicians that have these extravagant guitars on stage. There's a reason why some of these guitars are still around, like SGs and Les Pauls and stuff like that. I mean, the Les Paul, what, 1958, 59? Uh, SGs, 19, well, technically 58, 59, they were called Les Pauls, and then they were called SGs, I think, in 61 on. Um, and they still have the, those core guitars, you know, slightly modded so that they're a little more reliable. But the, 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 you know, the recipe hasn't changed in, you know, how many years is that? 70 years, <laughs> 60, 70 years. And people are still seeking after these guitars. Is it just because they absolutely love the Led Zeppelin sound or, or, uh, you know, old Eric Clapton SG sound or Tony Iommi? No, I don't think it's that. It's because those guitars produce sounds at volumes where when you play them, it's just like you can really hear the guitar and you can really hear what it has to offer. Uh, Paul Reed Smiths are like that. Those things seem to be, those things seem, I, I always wanted one, but I, they were always out of my price range. And of course, you know, I was more of a Gibson fan than a uh, Paul Reed Smith fan, but some of those things, I've heard a few of them at like concert volume, and I remember hearing Ted Nuge playing his with the Damn Yankees. It was an outdoor stadium, and I, that guitar sounded killer. And I mean, what was he doing? He was playing right pretty much through a bunch of, you know, he was just surrounded by Marshall Stacks, right? Uh, seeing Van Halen live, obviously, with his uh, signature series Ernie Ball guitars at the time, I always found those things. I, I did get to play them at some jam nights and some good ones, too. Uh, and they were really good at volume. They were, they sounded really good. You know, they weren't my style of guitar to play per se, neck wise, but they were really good. And then you start getting into like your Ibanez's, which Ibanez, I love Ibanez guitars for their designs because they're, they got like five piece maple necks, uh, whatever. 
these things like they just stay straight and, and they hold up Ibanez tend to make a really good product but they you know their lower end stuff is made out of cheaper materials they just really really refine the design right so you get a good sounding guitar but then if you play like say uh, you know the, the lower end like geo model Ibanez's you can get really good sounds out of them because the guitar is really well designed right now you start saying okay well that's not too bad whatever okay it's, it's it's pretty good I can live with that but then you grab one of their prestige models okay yeah don't pick one up if you can't afford one because you will hate yourself for not being able to buy it, it they are that good you know they just but they have a very distinctive sound their bridge systems uh, they I think that that's the best locking system out there that I've tried is the edge tremolos that Ibanez makes their signature tremolos I find them much better than the Floyd's and a lot of more dynamic uh, but we'll get into those kind of discussions later but you hear like an Ibanez RG style guitar with a swamp ash body holy <laughs> you know if you've ever played a swamp ash guitar at high volumes it is, it is something to hear it, it really really is something to hear so when I talk to people about tone woods okay it's like I can look at a guitar's recipe you know like I mean every guitar now pretty much the manufacturer tells you exactly what what it's made with and there's some woods out there like uh, Morenti I don't know and, and uh, what's the other one there's a couple of like uh, there's laurel wood I that's kind of like the new replacement for rosewood it seems um, I, I don't know I haven't heard a Morenti body guitar enough to tell you whether I like it or not um, again right now it seems like uh, if I want a metal guitar that's kind of not death metal sound but like a classic metal whatever but modern sounding I, I like Alder I think Alder is the way to go uh, and then if you really want to brighten up the the fingerboard use all maple if not use uh, ebony and Alder that would be a cool combination ebony and uh, or rosewood and Alder, uh, and, uh, and Alder seem to be a nice combination on the hammer right so you play different guitars you get different things and a lot of tone woods too like your fingerboard tone would will probably affect the sound of your guitar probably even more than uh, even more than uh, you know the body will but it all it all plays in again all those the nuances in the subtleties at high volume you'll start to hear it you know what I mean and when you hear it really clear and when you hear a guitar that you know like no matter how much uh, you, you try to put good effects on it no matter how much you compress it no matter how much you drive you put to it it just sounds muddy at high volumes you're going to get sick of that guitar or it sounds nasally or it sounds like uh, really uh, you know twangy or whatever all that changes a neck through body versus um, versus um, what you call it uh, you know bolt-on necks a lot of guys like bolt-on necks but it's like okay you're gonna like the bolt-on neck for certain reasons but when you have a neck through body the first thing you notice is that the guitar just resonates better uh, understandably so because it's, it's it's now one you know the wood is pretty much all one piece right now right um, I mean pros and cons of neck through body versus uh, I've never had a problem with neck through body guitars it's just when they're done they're done you know what I mean um, you know and everybody always says yeah but if you break a neck through body you can't fix it the same way you can just replace the neck on a on a uh, you know bolt on yeah that is an argument there but it tone wise I don't think you're gonna beat uh, a neck through body because again the more solid it's like the argument between floating bridge and fixed bridge right that plays it like usually you get more sustained and clarity out of a fixed bridge but I would also say that if you compare a fixed bridge guitar to fixed bridge uh, of the same formula of guitar whether it's an SG or a Strat uh, a modern guitar and you find two or three guitars with different bodies uh, we'll take a Jackson soloist you get different grade levels of Jackson soloists you do uh, the ones with the mahogany sound great the ones with the, the if you can find one with a swamp ash try it out you're gonna love it um, and their neck through body right uh, you try the the basswood body yeah you know okay yeah better pickups in a, in a basswood body guitar is just better pickups in a basswood body guitar 
Now, I know your amplifier will change your tone even probably more than the tone woods will. Um, but here's what I'll say about amplifiers, okay? When you're talking stage volume, okay, I'm not talking about the garage band that just cranks everything to 11 or 12 just to get as loud as they can. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a professional sound where you get on stage, you're loud, projecting, but you sound good. Now, I, I'll use two of my own amps, and I've had a, quite a few amps over the years, but I'll use two of my own amps that I use live quite a bit. Uh, uh, well, maybe, except for one, I didn't use it live yet. So, uh, well, technically I jammed with it a bunch of times at volume, but I, you know, I haven't played in, on the stage with it. But it doesn't matter. I've heard these amps on stage many times because they're very popular. And the first one is my RT100 Randall. Although it was a transistor amp, okay, it was it was at, in the, in the, back in the 80s. That was about as close as you could get to uh, a transistor amp, in my opinion, sounding like tubes. It had lots of dynamic. This was a really great sound. It was bright. It was punchy. It, it did everything. And I had that hook basically uh, through my Mesa Boogie 4x12 cap. Okay, so that amp at stage and it had a line out right direct to the PA which was really really cool that also gave me a stellar sound live because I didn't have to push the, the the stage volume as much but here's one thing that I noticed when I didn't have the direct line in or miking in front of the uh, the amp my best tonal qualities on that amp for dirty were between like say five and six right where you got the most drive the most lead and the best tonal qualities where it, it just you were right in the middle of what it could do once you got past six, the sounds, the, the tonal quality started to drop off of the amp. You were now pushing the amp past its 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 prime sound, right? Now in the clean sound, it was really good. I mean, this amp at you know four or five would still stay clean because it was a transistor amp. There was no breakup. But after five, it started to get really chunky on the clean sound, and didn't matter what guitar you put through it, it was no longer no longer really a clean channel at that point right so at that point you would have to mic the, that amp if you wanted to keep, maintain its integrity unless you were going to play dirty the whole night but if you wanted a clean channel which i did a lot of back and forth clean channel dirty channel you know some of the me heavy metal stuff that i played in the 80s a lot of it had some clean parts in it and stuff like that but it would get too chunky and it had almost not enough to say it was distorted but just really thick sounding and it would rob you of a bit of tone so at that point you would have to throw uh, a mic in front of the cab uh, just because you could get more volume out of it but you wouldn't get more tone out of it right but mind you most places I played that was more than loud enough most of the time I was on two or three uh, or four across the board on the lead and the clean sometimes I'd have clean it cut through a bit more so uh, you know whatever I'd mix it at I'd mix it at I didn't always have to go full blast because I had the sound, right? And at those sounds, once you start getting that mic, you've got the best sound that your cab and your head can produce at the most volume you can produce it at. So you got stage volume where you need it more, you know, and if you need, and, and then the monitors are now pushing the volume to the crowd, right? And that the monitors obviously brighten up your sound because, you know, you get that hi-fi uh, sound, I guess is what they call it. Uh, you know, speaker, you know, monitor uh, PA speakers tend to have more highs and more lows, right? And which really makes your guitar sound stellar because it adds extra tones on there, but it also smoothens out the sound and clears up the sound and all that. So what happens is you have a really clear sounding guitar. So whatever imperfections you have in your sound of your guitar or your amp or whatever, that PA is going to be honest to you and tell you whether your guitar sounds good or not. And that's when you're going to realize where the base of it all doesn't really just come down to the amp. A good sounding amp is a good sounding amp. A crappy sounding amp is a crappy sounding amp. Nothing you can do about that, right? Uh, but we'll get into amp discussions later. But what you can say is that even with a shitty mic or a good mic, uh, the PA is still going to be clear. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, how much volume can you get out of it, right? Uh, well, you know, if you have a decent mic on there, well, now you've got something that's being even more honest to you because it's even clearer, right? So you've got a, you know, top of the line uh, SM58, you know, which, you know, workhorse of a mic. They're not the most top of the line mic out there. I know that, but they're a good stage mic for micing guitar amps and stuff like that. Maybe not the best, but 
during the industry standard, every stage I've ever been on has pretty much had SM58s and SM57s, right? And now you've got these big gigantic JBLs, 500 watt speakers, and there's 20 of them facing back at you, which is really cool. And big floor monitors that you can walk out on, which is even cooler, that are like, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 watts each. And then you've got monitors on top of the stage hanging from, uh, you know, suspended, uh, throwing out to the crowd. And they're, you know, gazillion watts each, whatever. Now you've got an honest representation of your guitar sound. So you plug in this guitar, okay, and it sounds phenomenal. You plug in the other guitar, uh, it's not as clear. Now you hear all the imperfections in that guitar. It has a muddy, it has dead frets on it. Oh my God. Like, it's like, why does this guitar, every note I play, just scream out like my SG? Like, uh, my SGs are both like that, where every note just screams out. There's no dead notes on either of these guitars. Even the 61 with a slight bow in the neck, it's not that bad, but it's, you know, it's not optimal. It's not as perfect as it could be, but yet there's no dead spots on that guitar. The problem is that guitar is so darn lively when you get them up to, to volume. Uh, this guitar here, this thing sounded stellar at volume. I never got to hear it through a really good PA system, but it did handle volume quite well because it had good pickups in it. And just the thing it was the size of a dresser, so it just resonated so well. It was a loud guitar uh, and it was very clear. Uh, plus the 12 string just put chills down everybody's spine. It was, it was awesome. Um, so that's what you, you start to pick up on is that it, it, there's a whole package there, but now you've got a guitar that you can say that that's my professional guitar. That guitar is a good practice guitar, maybe a good backup guitar, but it's not, you know, like regardless how cool it looks, how great it sounds uh, or how fun it sounds, it is to play or whatever it just isn't going to be a studio guitar. It's not going to be that. Uh, the other way to hear tone woods is obviously in the studio with headphones on. The better the headphones, the clearer it is, the more honest that's going to be on your tone, right? Telling you whether you've got a muddy sounding guitar, a tinny sounding guitar, a scratchy sounding guitar. Some guitars get really scratchy at high volumes. Uh, it's a weird thing. The G string just starts to like get really twangy and then the, the E and the A get really bassy and muddy. And then you get this weird scratchiness off the B and the E. And it's just like, it just sounds horrible. But yet at practice amp volume, it sounds great. You know what I mean? Now, my second amp is a tube amp. And that is the Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. Now, this amp is just a beast. It, it, it's only 40 watts out. But here's the thing. It's 180 watts in and 40 watts out. So you get that full 40 watts at all volumes. However, it's the Hot Rod Deluxe. So what that means is... You get almost all your volume between, uh, say, 2 and 4, right? After that, you're pretty much, between 4 and 6, you get a little more volume, and between 6 and 12, yes, the amp goes to 12. Take that spinal tap. Uh, and between 6 and 12, there's just a little bit more volume, not by much. But your tonal qualities die out very quick after 6. Uh, these tube amps are not meant to be played on 12. They're not, they're really not. You're not, that's not what they're designed for. They're designed to give you a lot of volume, a lot of power and clarity and, you know, all the highs, the lows, the, everything you need at a moderate volume, right? Which on a Hot Rod Deluxe, there's no such thing as moderate volume. It's probably the, the most rowdy amp on the market uh, for what it is. It's not the heaviest sounding amp, but it's just those 6L6 tubes just like, it's, they're like axe murderers. They just, they just, really the guitar just barks at everything it's it's the crossest dog on the block i love them they're great uh, if you love feedback and in, in that classic vintage sound you know rock your face off kind of really crunchy sound but not like punk crunchy but like you know classic 80s metal kind of sound hot rod deluxe is a great amp it's a kind of a one trick pony but it's a great trick what it does uh but here's the thing that amp is basically a single channel amp with two, uh, a clean and a dirty, and then it has a, a third option of uh, a boost, right? So you have four, uh, sorry, two 6L6 tubes in there, and you have another two uh, AX12-7s in there. So the AX12-7s are basically a pre-tube. They're, they're, they're what give you these nice, really brilliant highs. Um, I love AX12-7s. They're, they're just fantastic. Now, that amp, okay, uh, I can hook it to my Mesa Boogie half cap sometimes and it just, it's just, it's so overkill. It's, it's not funny. 
Uh, I love it. It just shakes the house. It, it, it's great. It, it can achieve concert volume without, uh, in most bars, without being mic'd. It doesn't need to. In fact, most people that play Hot Rod Deluxes usually end up turning them back to the wall because they're too loud. Uh, and they just cut through everything. It's a very high mid-range amp, so again, it's very barky. Uh, and what happens with it is that amp, if you want a clean channel, once you get past two and a half or three, you start getting tube breakup, no matter where you bias the tubes. Even if you turn the tube, the bias the tubes to be as cool as possible, that amp will still break up after three. And then three to four, it's you might as well say it's a crunch channel. It's not a you don't have a clean channel like that. Maybe with a, a Stratocaster or a Telecaster with a really low output, say like Al Nickel 5 pickups, you could probably get up maybe to 6 before it would uh, get to break up. But otherwise, if you're playing any sort of Gibson or SG or modern guitar with high output pickups, you do not have a clean channel on that amp after that. So it means if you want a clean channel, you're going to have to mic that amp or hook up the cab, you know, whatever, a, a secondary cab. Now, here's where it gets interesting. For the lead channel, okay, like I say, your best tonal qualities are going to be between, like, say, two and a half and four. After four, it's just, like, four to six, you still got, a, you got tons of volume, probably too much stage volume for most people in an average little bar or whatever. But at that, at that point, like, between four and six, it's just so much that it just uh you still got the tonal qualities but now you're starting to get outside the tonal qualities where you're starting to get dark and muddy and the mids are starting to come a, come out a little bit uh, raunchy you know what i mean and you're starting to lose the smooth sound of the amp or well it's not a smooth sounding amp you're, you're starting to lose the the tight sound of the amp so at that point you're gonna mic it now here's the thing if you have that amp set up stellarly and you mic it let me tell you what's happened now i didn't do this uh with uh with the um with the hot rod deluxe although i've heard many of them mic'd on stage and they sound uh you know les paul playing through them and it just it, the sound is just killer uh it doesn't matter if it's an epiphone les paul or a or an actual gibson les paul the the gibson probably going to sound a little bit better uh, but the Epiphones, they still sound good at those volumes. In fact, for cheap guitars, I find Epiphone makes really good quality cheap guitars. That G400 right in the center there, I think, is probably one of the best starter guitars you can get. You don't have to get the G400, you can get the, the Special. It's just, it's a good guitar. It intonates fairly well. It's a fixed bridge. It sounds okay. It's not going to have any killer tone, but it's a good jam like guitar and stuff like that. Uh, but I played... And you can see it on this channel, and you can and you can hear it. You can hear the liveliness and the character of my '61 reissue. Uh, and I was playing at the Cafe 1870, and it was just me and this girl Andrea. We were playing uh, Fairies Wear Boots, and I'm playing through a Fender Junior 10 watt Junior tube damp, right? And it's mic'd. Uh, well, it's not mic'd directly. It's just it was close enough to the mic. One of the mics was, uh, you know, close enough to it that it was, like I say, the mics are miking the mics that are miking the mics that got miked from the mics, right? <laughs> so, like, everything just picks up. And all of a sudden, this little, tiny little 10-watt uh, Fender Junior uh, has this killer-sounding, overdriven SG. Now, mind you, the SG overdrove that amp to the point where you could not get a clean channel out of it whatsoever, hardly at all. Uh, it was it was really tricky to get anything clean. Uh, but it, it it was just I was just on the compass. But when I played uh, I played up there. You when you just hear me in the SG, you hear that that crazy almost Tony I only like tone out of that SG61 reissue through just this little amp. But what's giving you the sound is not just the amp and the guitar. You're now getting the character through the monitors, right? So that was just telling me, you know, like it was, again, it was just like resonation of the mics picking it up, pick, micing the mic, micing the mic, you know, vibrations through the floor, just get going through the mics. Not enough to get any feedbacks or anything unwanted like that, but just enough to give you that little extra ambience through the monitors. And again you can hear the purity of the tone of the guitar now when the bass player jumped up there and the drummer jumped up there and we did uh johnny be good and, and rocker which was really fun it was it was a halloween night that was the first time i played that guitar on stage with anybody in the room 
And I mean, that guitar really cut through and it was just, it had such a bark to it through that little 10 watt amp, which is just basically a, a baby version of the Hot Rod Deluxe. It's, it's a lot of amp for the money. Uh, you know, it's not a practice amp in the sense it's a tube damp, it's 10 watts, it doesn't sound like much, but trust me, you, you, you can get evicted with a 10 watt tube damp out of your apartment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there's that Hammer Diablo I was talking about. There, those two guitars played a lot of shows. Uh, you know, uh, the Les Paul was really reliable because when you broke a string, it, it's, it still stayed in tune. And at one point, I did have a, a uh, Samer Duncan Les Paul 59 in there. And it really cleaned up the tone of that Les Paul. I don't know why I took it out. I think I put it in another guitar. And I don't know where that pickup ended up, but the, it was a good pickup. And it really changed. It really cleared up the sound of that already good sounding. Like that, that Epiphone Les Paul I, I had sounded as good as a uh, regular Les Paul standard. The, yeah, the, the frets weren't as, fret work was not as nice as the Gibson. The neck was a little bit more knobbier. But and the guitar was actually heavier because unlike the Gibsons, it didn't have the weight relief in it. But it was a solid mahogany neck and body, and with the maple, you know, the the maple arch top that you typically get on a Les Paul standard. Uh, and the pickups that were in it weren't bad. But when I put the, the Les Paul 59 Duncan pickup in there, it it turned it into Slash's guitar. It sounded really killer. However, it didn't quite sound as good as the Hammer. Where the difference was was in the fretwork. The Hammer had excellent fretwork on it not a dead note on the guitar until the neck started warping on me uh and again i already told the story of what happened my singer old singer didn't know better and he left my guitar and the other guitar player's guitar in the back of the his car all week you know between gigs and stuff like that in the winter and you know we'd go from like minus 30 minus 40 into these hot bars so you know with like all these lights on us and like the guitars were like they wouldn't stay in tune it's like what's going on it wasn't just me it was the other guitar player too so two guitars unfortunately got ruined if you want to ruin a, a, your favorite guitar play live with it uh but anyway uh yeah no that les paul sounded good but it never did that sound as good as that because of the fret work where that les paul not every fret sang out like my SGs or like that Hammer or like the Ibanez's. Uh, for example, my that Jackson Flying B, you see, that neck sounds good. It plays amazing. But there's a few frets on there where the notes just, you know, you, you it's like, you, and this is a weird thing that happens to guitars at high volume, uh, where if the fretwork isn't perfect, what happens is you hit a note that would normally at practice amp volume would ring and ring and ring. But then you get at the really high notes and you play it and the note almost drops off and dies off right away. That was one of the things about this Les, the, the Epiphone Les Pauls is some of them are, you know, they're, they're, they don't have that extra refinement that the Gibson is. That's what you're paying that so much extra for. A lot of people don't know that. But you learn that stuff at the higher volumes. That's why all the pros don't play cheap guitars. They play expensive guitars because they're well set up and all that. So Tone Woods is one of it. Amp is another uh effects is another and of course uh you know the, the the hardware on the guitar is another it all plays in but the core of all your sound comes back to whatever you're amplifying doesn't matter if you buy the best pickups in the world you put the best pickups in the world clearest pickups in the world in a cheap guitar you just amplify a cheap guitar you know it'll probably sound better because you got better pickups but it won't improve the tone you can't improve the tone the tone is the tone right you can only amplify it and play around and mix mix it you know you can do that but you can't improve the base of the tone so if you're starting with a guitar that doesn't have good tonal qualities to begin with then there's really not much you can do now here's where it gets bad uh not bad but the kicker uh, is that almost every guitar that comes out of a factory nowadays there's the the uh, the randall head i was talk, talking about uh sounds good like even the cheap like back in the 80s and 90s a 300 dollar samic guitar was uh you know trying to play like on a rotten tree stump it just did not sound good uh it, it you know like they were almost unplayable uh there was uh i remember there was some of the harmony guitars not like this one but like you know sears used to sell them and you know like the the, the action on the strings was like an inch and a half off the fingerboard you know plywood body guitars they didn't sound great you know what i mean and some of them were barely playable and the frets were sharp on the side if they didn't have binding on the neck and there was a whole bunch of there was a whole bunch of guitars like that uh yamaha had really cheap 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 guitars but then somewhere around the end of the 90s into the early 2000 manufacturing got a lot better that the 300 dollars guitars 
were now no longer junk. You know, like you could play my Les Paul uh, Epiphone. Uh, that was a 92. It said Gibson on the headstock. It was, I think, the, the first year Gibson had kind of like started putting out more core models of, of uh, Epiphone, like, you know, of the Les Pauls and stuff like that, and the SGs and whatever. They started doing that. And again, they, they built a really good guitar. Yeah, they were built in Korea, but like I say, the, that Epiphone Les Paul was a great sounding guitar live. In fact, my, my one of my rhythm guitar players, he, because he was a big fan of Slash, he always wanted to play that guitar because his, uh, I don't remember what Les Paul copy he had. He had a bolt-on neck Les Paul copy. And the thing, it, like again, he was a good guitar player, but it was a really crappy guitar. And that guitar sounded killer. That guitar on one side of the stage in my Hammer Diablo green guitar on the other side of the stage was a really epic sound coming out of those monitors. Uh, his amp was, wasn't too bad. You know, he had, he had a little Marshall amp or whatever he had. Uh, I think he had a PV Bandit at one point, you know, a little mud monster like that. Uh, fun, fun amp, so. Um, but the thing is, is that, the you know, you can now buy like guitars like that Jackson Flying V playability wise that thing okay it's not the best playing guitar in the world but man it plays like if you're learning on that guitar and you can't learn how to play it's because you can't learn how to play uh that guitar a professional could pick it up play it and just wow be wowed by it however at concert volume yeah you'll have fun playing that guitar hopefully it'll go in the mix but it's never going to give you those tones that are just going to make the show just that much better now the good news is most people cannot distinguish even most guitar players can't distinguish between, uh, you know, tonal qualities of guitars. So here's a, if you can't, if you're one of those people, this, I'm going to help you right now. Here's how you do it. Number one, if you can't get to concert volume with a guitar, but you go to a concert, really pay attention to the sound and tonal qualities of the guitar of whatever artist you're listening to. If he uses different guitars, make a note of it. Saying, oh, okay, yeah, that thing seems to sound a little brighter. It has a little more punch. Okay, this one has a lot of mids. Wow, that one really pops out through. Oh, wow, that one's nice and smooth across the board. And that's why you'll get different guitars will give you different things, right? That's why there's no such thing as the magic guitar that does absolutely everything. There are some great guitars that can do just about everything, but there's no one guitar that's perfect at everything, right? There's always a trade-off somewhere. Like a Strat will never be as great sounding for heavy stuff as a Les Paul. Les Paul will never be as bubbly as a Stratocaster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, tool to the job. But if you can't get to the to the to the rocket loud volumes that you need to re and the monitors and you just not you just not going to be there, uh, and you, the practice amp and the headphones aren't quite doing it for you. Here's where you start. Number one, next time you go into a music store, don't care what the music store is. Go and look at every guitar you can. Try to find similar models of the same guitar. Les Pauls and Stratocasters are a good example. Play each Stratocaster. Look at the makeup of, you know, the ones with the rosewood fingerboard, the ones with the maple fingerboards, uh, stuff, uh, you know, stuff like that. Find out what the bodies are made out of. Listen to them. Listen to them unplugged. I will go along with a pick in my hand in a guitar store and I will strum each guitar I'm like, okay, that sounds a good, okay, basswood body, rosewood fingerboard, or laurel fingerboard, maple neck, okay, yeah, not bad, doesn't sound bad, like, that's the thing, none of them sound bad, and then you hit one that has a mahogany body, ebony fingerboard, uh, you know, it, it, you, you hit it, and it's just like, whoa, the guitar is like almost twice as loud, and twice as clear, and twice as sustainy, and twice as, twice as, as, as the, the, the other guitar are the same model, it's just, the recipe is much better, it's like, you know, Everybody's grandma can make a pie, right? Not everybody's grandma's pies are equal. You know what I'm saying? It, it, you know, like there's just some gra grannies that can make a better pie, even though it's the same apple pie. It's just not every apple pie is equal. Well, guitars are the same. And I learned this uh, working in a music store for a little bit as well. You know, like a, you know, like really, you know listening to cheap acoustics and expensive acoustics and sometimes i'll grab a guitar and it's like okay it's 5.99 okay and you pick it up and it's like this thing is freaking awesome it sounds great and then you pick up a guitar it's 15.99 and it's like it doesn't even sound as good as that 5.99 guitar so you start hunting after tone woods and all of a sudden you're picking guitars for different reasons like for example guitars i i, I dream about getting uh i've had a lot of guitars too so you know over the years 
Uh, one guitar I would like to get next is a seven string with a deeper scale. Obviously, scale length is probably going to affect your sound even more than the um, than the tone woods, but it all plays in, right? So uh, I'm looking for a seven string guitar. I, I don't want a baritone. I want a seven string uh, because a, a baritone is basically a, a seven string with a broken E. Um, so I, I, I want a seven string. So I get that baritone sound, but I also want uh you know to go completely opposite of that and i'll give you the formula of the guitar that i would like to have i don't know if i'll ever be able to afford it but the mark holcomb guitar it's a prs guitar uh they're around 15 1600 dollars something like that canadian it has a mahogany body with a maple veneer uh on the top as you typically see on a paul reed smith it's an se model it has a bounded neck, which is nice, but it's neck through body, so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get good resonation there. And then on top of that, it has a uh, ebony fingerboard, so you know you're gonna get a dark, heavy sounding guitar, very clear and whatever. And then it's got, I don't know if it has active pickups or not. I think the pickups are active in it, uh, and it's a fixed bridge, so you know you got yourself a tone monster right there. That is gonna be what I'm gonna call my driving metal guitar, not my lead metal guitar, but my driving metal guitar. The lead guitar I'd like to have right now, I'd like to try one again. Well, I'd love to have my Hammer Diablo back uh, as the lead guitar or a Kramer Nightshawn. Mahogany body, ebony fingerboard, maple neck, bolt-on, sure, whatever, but 25 and a half inch scale, right? Or, or I think, no, it's 24 and three quarter inch scale. So that guitar is going to be really dominating the mid-range. Now, I've already got my SG, so I got that. Uh, now, to co go completely 180 from these guitars, from the metal scene, I want something really nice sounding. I'm looking at a good, you can go look at it yourself. It, it, they're cool. I, I picked one up and I played one and I thought it was kind of neat. And it's the Buddy Guy Strat. It's outer body, maple neck, maple fingerboard. Bright, bubbly, clean, single coils. There you go. And 25 and a half scale, twangy. So now you got a surf guitar sound, uh, a twangy guitar sound, uh, a bluesy guitar sound, and then you got these death metal sounds. And then if you want somewhere in between, SGs. So hopefully this this is a was an interesting conversation. Hopefully some people uh, will like it. Uh, I like talking about stuff like this because it, you know when you start getting understanding and stuff like that, it you're going to save a lot of money of the guitars you're not going to waste your money on right and i've already done that route where you buy like a whole bunch of 500 dollar guitars and it's just like they're never perfect you know what i mean they're always in that budget range and it's like i'm at the point now where there's no point in buying a guitar unless it serves a purpose now my jackson flying v i bought it because it's a jam it's going to be a jam like guitar it's a 400 hundred dollar guitar right so i'm not it, it's good enough to play on in, in you know like for intermediate players and whatever good enough to gig with but if something bad happens to it, it's not like losing one of my Gibsons or something like that. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. So if you like this kind of content, all links are down below. Thank you so much to everybody uh, who's helped support the channel. Rate, uh, rate, comment, share, like. Be true to yourself. Be true to others. Always, always do the right thing. Have yourselves a great day. Eh?